Good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Grace Lee, Chair of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Today is July 19th, 2022, and I'm pleased to call today's ACIP meeting to order. Um, I'll turn it over to Dr. Melinda Wharton this morning to share today's announcements. Uh, good morning, and welcome to the July 19th uh, virtual ACIP meeting. Next slide, please. Uh, copies of the slides being presented at today's meeting are available or will be available soon on the ACIP website. Additionally, slides are available through a share file link for ACIP voting, liaison, and ex officio members. Uh, a few reminders on meeting logistics for those who are listening in on the Zoom line. Uh, please mute your lines at all time until you're called on for discussion. When Dr. Lee opens the meeting for discussion, please use the raise hand function to virtually raise your hand. During the discussion period, Dr. Lee will take questions first from voting ACIP members and then from ex officio members and liaison representatives. Please keep your video disabled except for when we do votes and then we'll ask you to turn on your video. Next slide. The Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices is, at its heart, a public body and engagement with the public and transparency in our processes are vital to the committee's work. For this meeting, we will be holding one oral public comment period at approximately 12.20 p.m. Eastern Time. To create a fairer and more efficient process for requesting to make an oral comment, we ask that people interested in making an oral comment su submit a request online in advance of the meeting. Uh, we give priority to those advanced requests, and if more people request to speak uh, than can be accommodated, uh, we conduct a blind lottery to determine who the speakers will be. Speakers selected in the lottery for this meeting have been notified in advance of the meeting. Members of the public can also submit written public comments uh, via regulations.gov using docket number ID CDC 2022-0085. Um, information on the written public com comment process as well as uh, the process for making a, a uh, comment at the meeting can be found on the ACIP meeting website. Next slide, please. As noted in the ACIP Policies and Procedures Manual, members of the ACIP agree to forgo participation in certain activities related to vaccines during their tenure on the committee. For certain other interests that may enhance a member's expertise while serving on the committee, CDC has issued limited conflict of interest waivers. Members who conduct clinical, uh, vaccine clinical trials or who serve on data safety monitoring boards may present to the committee uh, on matters related to those vaccines, but those members are prohibited for, from participating in committee votes on issues related to those vaccines. Regarding other vaccines of a concerned company, a member may participate in discussions with the provision that he or she abstains from all votes related to the vaccines of that company. At the beginning of each meeting, ACIP members state any conflicts of interest. Next slide. We are currently soliciting applications and nominations for candidates to fill upcoming vacancies on the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Detailed instructions for submission of names for potential candidates to serve as ACIP members are now available on the ACIP website. The deadline for applications for ACIP membership has been extended to August 15, 2022, for the four-year term beginning July 2023, so next year. We'll be filling six positions at that time, including a consumer representative position. Next slide. Uh, and with that, I will turn the virtual podium back over to Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wharton. Um, we will now proceed with our roll call for today. Um, and we will start with Ms. Bata. Good morning. Uh, this is Lynn Bata. I am a public health nurse uh, and function as the immunization clinical consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Ms. Bata. Dr. Chen? Wilbur Chen, professor of medicine, uh, adult infectious disease physician at the University of Maryland School of Medicine's Center for Vaccine Development and Global Health. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Sineas? 
Good morning. I am Sybil Tineas. I am an internist and pediatrician. I am an associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at the Warren Alpert Medical School of Brown University, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Paling? Good morning. This is Kathy Paling. I am professor of pediatrics and epidemiology and prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine, Atrium Health, Wake Forest Baptist, um, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paling. Uh, Dr. Talbot. Good morning. I'm Kip Talbot. I'm an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases, um, and I have no conflict. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Dr. Long. Good morning, this is Sarah Long. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine and a pediatric infectious disease physician. I have no conflict. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Daly. Uh, good morning, Matt Daly. I'm a senior investigator at the Institute for Health Research at Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, and I'm also an associate professor of pediatrics, University of Colorado School of Medicine. I have no conflicts of interest. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Daly. Dr. Lair. Good morning. This is Dr. Jamie Lair. I'm a family physician in private practice in Ithaca, New York, and I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Cotton. Good morning, Dr. Camille Cotton, um, Massachusetts General Hospital. I'm the Clinical Director of Transplant and Immunocompromised Host Infectious Diseases, and I am Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. I have no conflict. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. Dr. Brooks. Uh, good morning, Dr. Oliver Brooks, Chief Medical Officer, Watts Healthcare Corporation, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez, are you on? Okay, we'll come back. Uh, this is Grace Lee. I'm a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine, associate CMO for Stanford Children's Health, and I have no conflicts. <clears throat> Next, we will move on to our ex officio liaisons, and I will announce your organization name, and then please indicate if you're present and your first and last name. We'll start with Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Jose Romero, Director, NCIRD. Thank you, and good morning, Dr. Romero. Um, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Hi, this is Mary Beth Hans from CMS. Thank you. Food and Drug Administration. Hi, this is Becca Ryandell. I'm acting senior advisor and this is the Dorn thing today. Thank you. Health Resources and Services Administration. Hi, this is Reed Grimes with HRSA. Thank you. Indian Health Service. Good morning, this is Dr. Matthew Clark representing the Indian Health Service. Thank you. National Institute of Health. Good morning, John Beigel from the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Thank you, Dr. Beigel. Office of Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy. Good morning. This is David Tim with OIDT, representing the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Next, we'll move on to our liaison representatives, American Academy of Family Physicians. Good morning. Pamela Rockwell, Professor of Family Medicine at University of Michigan Medical School. Uh, representing AAFP. Thank you. American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, good morning, Sean O'Leary, representing AAP. Thank you. American Academy of Physician Associates. Good morning, Marie Michelle Leger, representing AAPA. American College Health Association. Good morning, Sharon McMullen and Dr. Tavi Chai, representing the American College Health Association. Thank you. American College of Nurse Midwives. Carol Hayes, present. Thank you. American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Good morning. It's Dr. Linda Eckert, University of Washington, representing ACOG. Thank you. Morning. Thank you. American College of Physicians. Good morning, Dr. Jason Goldman, General Internal Medicine, Private Practice, Carl Springs, Florida, Affiliate Associate Professor, Florida Atlantic University, representing American College of Physicians. Pleasure to be here. 
Thank you. American Geriatric Society. Morning, Ken Schmader for AGS. Morning. American Health Insurance, America's Health Insurance Plans. Yeah, this is Bob Gluckman, Chief Medical Officer for Providence Health Plans, representing AHIP. Thank you. Thank you. American Immunization Registry Association. Good morning. Elizabeth Perilla for ERA. Thank you. American Medical Association. Sandra Freihofer, General Internal Medicine Physician in Atlanta, Adjunct Associate Professor of Medicine at Emory University School of Medicine, representing the American Medical Association. Thank you. American Nurses Association. Good morning, Chad Riddle, representing the ANA. Thank you. American Osteopathic Association. Ben Grog, representing the American Osteopathic Association. Good morning. Morning, thank you. American Pharmacists Association. Good morning, this is Michael Hogue, Dean and Professor of Loma Linda University School of Pharmacy and Professor of Preventive Medicine at Loma Linda University School of Medicine, representing APHA. Thank you. Association of Immunization Managers. Hi, this is Molly Howell, representing AIMS. Thank you. Association for Prevention, Teaching, and Research. Good morning, Chrissy Molly Jeffel, Assistant Professor at the University of Pittsburgh Department of Family Medicine, representing APTR. Good morning, and thank you. Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. We'll move on to Biotechnology Innovation Organization. Good morning, Phyllis Arthur, representing Bio. Morning. Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Uh, hi, Dr. Christine Hahn, present. Thank you. Canadian National Advisory Committee on Immunization. Morning. Matthew Tunis here for NASI. Thank you. Infectious Diseases Society of America. Good morning. Jeff Tuchin, Health Officer, Public Health, Saddle in King County, and Professor of Medicine, University of Washington. Thank you. International Society for Travel Medicine. Good morning, Elizabeth Barnett here for ISTM. Good morning. National Association of County and City Health Officials. Uh, good morning. It's Matt Zahn representing NHO present. Good morning. National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. Good morning, Patsy Stinchfield for NAPNAP. Thank you. National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. Good morning. This is Bill Schaffner for the NFID. Good morning. National Medical Association. Pediatric infectious diseases. Oh, apologies, go ahead. Okay, I don't hear them uh, responding. So Pediatric Infectious Diseases Society. Good morning, Sean O'Leary. I'm also representing kids today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. O'Leary. Uh, Pharmaceutical Research and Manufacturers of America. Good morning, Corey Robertson, present. Thank you. Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine. Good morning, it's Amy Middleman um, representing Sam. Thank you. And Society for Healthcare Epidemiology of America. Good morning. Marcy Dries, Chief Infection Prevention Officer at Christiana Care, representing Shea. Thank you. And we'll go back up to Dr. Sanchez, if you could please state your name affiliation and if you have any conflicts of interest. Thank you. Um, Pablo Sanchez, I'm a neonatologist and pediatric infectious disease specialist at um, Nationwide Children's Hospital, The Ohio State University College of Medicine. Um, and I have no, um, I have no conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. And with that, we have quorum for today, and we can move on. Um, I, I just will check with briefly with Dr. Warden. Is there anything else we need to do before we're able to proceed? Uh, no, we can go on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to the first session for today. Uh, we will bring back our uh, chair of the COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup, Dr. Matthew Daly, to provide an introduction and overview of today's session. Dr. Daly, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks so much, Dr. Lee, and good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to be just introducing today's session on behalf of the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, this is the uh, figure that we've shown at prior meetings showing trends in daily number of COVID-19 cases in the United States between the start of the pandemic and July 14th of 2022. And in total, there have been more than 89 million cases reported in the US. Next slide, please. And then this shows the trends in daily number of COVID-19 deaths in the US throughout the pandemic. 
Um, and then in total, there have been uh, more than 1 million uh, deaths reported in the United States due to COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic. Next slide, please. So this uh, slide is important and we're gonna uh, spend a, a moment on this. Um, so this is a percentage of US adults age 18 and older who have not yet received any COVID-19 vaccine. So as you can see, depending on the data source, somewhere between 10.3% and 13.9% of all adults in the US have not received any vaccines. The darker gray is vaccinated with at least one dose. I would, I would caution and remind folks that uh, within those who've received at least one dose, there are uh, many individuals who need to complete the primary series and complete their boosters, so they're not fully protected. But going back to the left hand, there are between, again, uh, 10 and 13.9% who've not started the primary series. This translates to 26 to 37 million U.S. adults who haven't received any COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. So um, I want to review the activities of the ACIP COVID-19 uh, vaccines work group um, since we last met. So we have uh, reviewed the epidemiology of COVID-19 in adults. We've also looked at COVID-19 vaccine coverage in adults. In addition, we've uh, gone through some additional review of the benefits of COVID-19 vaccination in adults. Um, we've uh, had some in-depth review of uh, rare events of myocarditis following COVID-19 vaccination. And then in addition, we've heard about the safety and the efficacy of Novavax COVID-19 vaccine as a two-dose primary series in adults ages 18 years and older. Um, and then in addition, um, the vaccine work group looked at our interpretation of the safety and efficacy of the Novavax vaccine as a primary vaccine series. Next slide. So just to go through the agenda for today, um, first we'll hear from Dr. Fleming Dutra from the CDC who will review the epidemiology of COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccine coverage. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Shima Bukuro from the CDC, who will provide updates on vaccine-associated myocarditis. That'll be followed by a break. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Dubovsky from Novavax, who will present the safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy of Novavax as a two-dose primary series in adults ages 18 and older. Following Dr. Dubovsky, we will have a public comment period. That'll be followed by a break. And then after that, we'll hear from Dr. Twentyman from the CDC who will present Novavax COVID-19 vaccine in adults and the evidence recommendations framework. Following that, we'll hear from Dr. Paul from the CDC who will present clinical considerations updates. And then following that, we'll have a discussion and a vote. Next slide, please. I want to thank, um, sincerely thank all of the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines workgroup members, including ACIP members, ex officio and government members, liaisons, consultants, and the outstanding leadership of Drs. Oliver and Twentyman. Next slide. In addition to uh, a large number of CDC participants who've, uh, you know, again, I say it every time, but worked tireless hours, nights, weekends, I'm preparing for today's meeting and I want to thank them all as well. Next slide, please. Uh, I turn it back to you, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Next, we'll move on to the epidemiology of COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccine coverage by Dr. Catherine Fleming Dutra. Good morning. So we'll start today by discussing COVID-19 cases, um, including any infection. So next slide, please. As you've just seen, this graph shows the daily trends and the number of COVID-19 cases reported to CDC in the United States since the beginning of the pandemic. And as of July 14th, 2022, there have been more than 89 million total recorded cases of COVID-19 in the United States. The Omicron surge started in December 2021 and led to a large spike in COVID-19 cases through the winter of 2022. And as of July 14th, the seven-day moving average was more than 120,000 cases per day. It's important to note that not all COVID-19 cases are captured in this graph, which uses traditional disease surveillance methods, because some cases are asymptomatic, not diagnosed, or not reported, such as in the case of the use of at-home tests. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected certain racial and ethnic communities. This graph shows the percent of total COVID-19 cases reported to CDC throughout the pandemic by race and ethnicity shown in the red bars, compared to the percent of the U.S. population by race and ethnicity shown in the gray bars. 
you can see that Hispanic and Latino persons, American Indian and Alaska Native persons, and persons of, of multiple or other races who are non-Hispanic have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 infections. Next slide. And as we all know, the Omicron variant is currently predominant in the United States. This stack bar graph shows recent US trends in the national weighted estimates of variant proportions and now cast projections of circulating SARS-CoV-2 lineages by week of specimen collection from CDC's COVID data tracker. These data are through the week ending July 9th and new data are posted each Tuesday, so updated data will be available today. Omicron sublineages depicted in the purple, pink, and teal shades have been over 99% predominant for many months now. And by the week ending July 9th, the BA5 sublineage in the darker teal color comprised 65% of specimens, and BA4 shown in the lighter teal comprised 16.3%. Next slide. Now let's transition to talking about COVID-19 associated hospitalizations. Next. This graph shows weekly trends in the rates of new inpatient admissions among persons of all ages in the United States through July 10th. These data are from the Unified Hospital data set and posted on COVID data tracker. During the pandemic, there have been more than 4.9 million total admissions for COVID-19. And focusing on the most recent time period, you can see that there has been an uptick in hospitalization since April, 2022. Next. And the vast majority, or 97.2% of these admissions are occurring among adults ages 18 years and older. Next. If we look at these same data um, of new inpatient admissions by age group, as shown in this graph, we can see that higher hospitalization rates occur in the older age groups. Patients aged 70 years and older, shown in solid purple, and 60 to 69 and 50 to 59 years, shown in the dashed pink lines, have the highest admission rates followed by other adult age groups in shades of blue. Importantly on the right, you can see recent increases in the hospitalization rates have been driven by older age groups, especially among patients ages 70 years and older. Next slide. To look at COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates by race and ethnicity, we'll use COVIDnet data, which are different than the data shown in the last two slides. COVIDnet provides more granular information on COVID-19 associated hospitalizations. And this graph shows the cumulative population-based rates of COVID-19-associated hospitalizations through June 25, 2022, among persons of all ages by race and ethnicity. And you can see that American Indian and Alaska Native persons, shown in the lighter blue line, Black persons shown in the darker blue line, and Hispanic and Latino persons shown in red, have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19-associated hospitalizations. Next slide. Now let's talk about mortality due to COVID-19. Next. This graph shows the trends in the daily number of COVID-19 deaths reported in the United States since the beginning of the pandemic. And tragically, as of July 14th, there have been 1,018,578 deaths due to COVID-19 reported to CDC cumulatively in the US. Next slide. This graph now shows the weekly trends in COVID-19 associated mortality rates by age group and these data show that higher mortality rates are consistently observed in older age groups, and more than 99% of deaths occur in adults. The highest mortality rates occur among those aged 75 years and older, shown in purple, then 65 to 74, and 50 to 64 years, as shown in pink. Next slide. When we zoom in on the right side of this graph, we can see, similar to hospitalization rates, there has been a recent increase in COVID-19 death rates among older age groups, especially among those ages 75 years and older. Next. And when we look at the weekly COVID-19 mortality rates by race and ethnicity, we can see that over the course of the pandemic, there has been a changing and complex relationship between race and ethnicity and mortality rates. Early during the pandemic, black persons, as shown in the dashed orange line, had the highest rate of death compared to persons of other race and ethnicities. Then American Indian and Alaska Native persons, shown in the solid gold line, have been disproportionately affected throughout much of the pandemic. And during the Omicron surge, Hispanic persons, shown in the solid teal line, had the highest rate of COVID-19 mortality. Next slide. This table summarizes various CDC data sources regarding the risk of, for COVID-19 infection, hospitalization, and death by race and ethnicity, as presented by age-adjusted rate ratios compared to white non-Hispanic persons. And focusing on severe disease in the form of hospitalizations and death, you can see from this table, American Indian and Alaska Native persons, Black, and Hispanic and Latino persons have elevated risk of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations and death compared to white non-Hispanic persons. 
Of course, race and ethnicity are risk markers for other underlying conditions that affect health, including socioeconomic status, access to health care, and exposure to the virus related to occupation, such as among frontline, essential, and critical infrastructure workers. Next slide. Now we'll talk about COVID-19 disease trends by vaccination status, as we know that vaccination prevents disease. Next slide. This slide shows the age-adjusted rates of COVID-19 cases by vaccination status among persons ages five years and older. In June 2022, unvaccinated people aged five years and older shown in the black line on this graph had a 2.8 times higher risk of testing positive for COVID-19 compared to people vaccinated with at least a primary series shown in the blue line. Next slide. Now we can look at age-adjusted rates of COVID-19 associated hospitalizations by vaccination status in adults ages 18 years and older. Hospitalizations for COVID-19 were higher among unvaccinated persons shown in green than among vaccinated persons shown in blue. In May 2022, unvaccinated adults ages 18 years or older had a 3.5 times higher risk of COVID-19 associated hospitalization compared to people with, uh, who completed a primary vaccine series and at least one booster or additional dose. Next slide. And now looking at the age-adjusted rates of COVID-19 associated deaths by vaccination status, we can see that unvaccinated people ages 12 years and older, shown in the black line, had higher mortality rates than people who received a primary series, shown in the dashed blue line, or a primary series and a booster dose, shown in the solid blue line. In May 2022, unvaccinated people ages 12 years and older had a nine times higher risk of dying from COVID-19 compared to people vaccinated with a primary series and a booster dose. And we can see in this graph and in the two preceding figures that the benefits of vaccination are more pronounced when the disease burden is high. And we can predict that with future COVID-19 surges, the unvaccinated will continue to bear the burden of disease. Next slide. It's important to note that monitoring rates of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths by vaccination status has limitations. These are not vaccine effectiveness studies. Vaccine effectiveness studies allow for more robust analyses as compared with surveillance and a better understanding of how well vaccines are working in both periods of high and low disease incidence. Next slide. Now let's look at opportunities to increase uh, COVID-19 vaccination rates among U.S. adults. And by this, I mean which adults have yet to receive a COVID-19 vaccine and thus would be eligible for a primary series with Novavax should ACIP recommend this vaccine. Specifically, I will show how the proportion of unvaccinated persons varies by race and ethnicity and other socio-demographic characteristics. However, I will not be discussing intent to vaccinate among persons who have yet to receive a COVID-19 vaccine, as that will be discussed in a later presentation today. Next slide. This figure shows trends over time by age group and the percent of people who have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. And we can see that vaccination coverage is higher in older age groups. And at the top, we can see that the proportion, uh, the proportion by age group of people who received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine as of July 6, 2022. And conversely, just over 20% of U.S. adults ages 18 through 24 years, shown in the dashed blue line, just under 20% of adults 25 through 39 years, shown in the dashed green line, and 13% of adults 40 to 49 years in the solid green line have yet to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. As we, um, we've seen this uh, graph already today, and it shows um, data from both CDC's National Immunization Survey adult COVID-19 module and the vaccine administration data from COVID data tracker, and shows the percent of U.S. adults ages 18 years and older in these two data sources that have not re yet received a COVID-19 vaccine. In the National Immunization Survey conducted in May 2022, 13.9% of surveyed adults reported not yet receiving a COVID-19 vaccine versus 10.3% in the vaccine administration data in COVID data tracker. And using these data and census data, we can estimate that there are about 26 to 37 million U.S. adults who have not yet received a COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. This figure shows data from May in the National Immunization Survey and displays the percent of adults who report not yet receiving a COVID-19 vaccine by race and ethnicity. 22% of persons of other or multiple races, 20% of persons who are American Indian or Alaska Native, and 14% of persons who are Hispanic, and 14% of persons who are white have yet to receive a COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. If we look at these same data, now stratified by age group and four level race ethnicity, we see that again, higher proportions of younger adults 18 to 49 years remain unvaccinated than among older age groups. Among adults ages 18 through 49 years, people of other or multiple races who are non-Hispanic have the highest percentages remaining unvaccinated, while Hispanic persons have the lowest percentages remaining unvaccinated. 
Among adults 50 to 64 years, again, people of other or multiple races who are non-Hispanic have the highest percentages remaining unvaccinated, whereas black persons in this age group have the lowest pr proportion remaining unvaccinated. And as we have already seen, very few adults ages 65 years and older remain unvaccinated. Next slide. This figure shows these same data from the National Immunization Survey by Metropolitan Statistical Area. And we can see here that a higher percentage of US adults living in rural areas remain unvaccinated as compared to those living in suburban or urban areas. Next slide. And when we look at these same data by income and poverty status, we can see that a higher percentage of US adults with incomes less than $75,000, and particularly those living below poverty, remain unvaccinated compared to adults with higher incomes. Next slide. And when we look at these data by markers of access to health care, we see that a higher percentage of US adults who do not have a regular primary care provider remain unvaccinated compared to those who do, and a higher percentage of those who do not have health insurance remain unvaccinated compared to those who have health insurance. Next slide. Next. Next. Thanks. Um, in conclusion, as of July 14th, 2022, more than 89 million COVID-19 cases and more than 1 million COVID-19 deaths have occurred in the United States. COVID-19 continues to cause new cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. COVID-19 has contributed to health inequities. American Indian and Alaska Native, Black and Hispanic and Latino persons have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19 associated hospitalizations and deaths. We know that vaccination prevents COVID-19 cases, hospitalization, and death, but yet about 26 to 37 million US adults have not yet received a COVID-19 vaccine, and these adults will benefit from starting a COVID-19 vaccine primary series. Next slide. Of course, this uh, presentation is the work of many people who I would like to thank. Uh, next. Appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Fleming Dutra. This presentation is now open for any questions. Dr. Paling. So, um... Dr. Fleming, first of all, thank you for a very um, important and clear presentation on the epidemiology of COVID-19 and COVID-19 vaccination coverage. And I greatly appreciate the focus on unvaccinated because that's very important as we think about um, a new vaccine being um, uh, uh, discussed. Um, I wanted to also take a moment, though, and ask if you have any information about how many people have been um, boosted once and twice. And I ask this because we know that uh, Omicron is circulating and that there's additional coverage by having boost. And so if you have any information on that, that would be very important as well. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Paling, this is uh, Sarah Oliver. I, we have not um, presented that data today as the meeting is primarily focused on Novavax, which is the primary series. Um, the information on that is posted on the COVID data tracker. Um, and so we can, we're happy to kind of verbally share um, the proportions. Um, it's, like I said, it's, it's listed on the vaccination slide of the, the data tracker. Among the population, 65 and over 70% have received the first booster dose, and 35% have received a second booster dose. So we definitely know that there is room for improvement, especially with that second booster dose in the 50 and over population. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you. And then I believe um, just because um, there are many opportunities with COVID and protecting the population that a booster dose is also recommended for youngers, but we could go to the COVID-19 vaccine tracker to get that information, if I'm understanding you correctly. Yes, Dr. Penning, thanks. This is Dr. Fleming Dutra again. Um, yes, that those data are posted on um, COVID data tracker under um, that COVID-19 vaccinations in the United States um, and, and are publicly available by age group. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Yeah, thanks, uh, Dr. Fleming Dutra, for that for the presentation. Could you go to the slide showing risk of COVID-19 cases, hospitalization, and death by race? Um, I, I didn't. 
uh, write down exactly what slide yes. number that was. But yeah. So um, can you help us think of this in the context of what comes later about um, vaccination coverage? I was trying to look at uh, this is a, a great, very helpful slide, um, by the way. And so thank you for that. But I was trying to think about to what extent are these disparities a reflection of disparities in vaccination coverage versus other social determinants of health? And I realize this is surveillance data, and so then there's some limitations to what we can um, conclude from it. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Um, it, this is a, a really important question. Um, as you pointed out, these are um, these data are based on surveillance data, um, and um, so the, the cases are um, based on the um, the data reported to CDC on on total cases, the hospitalizations based on COVID net data and then the deaths from um, the National Vital Statistics um, System. Um, these data, I think, reflect probably all of the things that you just talked about, um, vaccination coverage, but also other social determinants of health. And, and vaccine coverage is not, um, it's not included in this particular analysis. I don't know um, if, I, I believe we may have Dr. Taylor from COVID on. I don't know if he, he wants to add any, any additional as, as he did the, um, or their team did the analysis from COVID net. Hi, Dr. Fleming Dutra. This is Chris Taylor with COVIDnet. Um, I, I guess one caveat that I would note, um, speaking just for the hospitalization data, is that this figure, um, looking at risk um, by age-adjusted uh, rate ratios, is that it's cumulative. Um, so it takes into account all hospitalizations that occurred from March 2020 um, through the period ending June 11, 2022. Um, so I think obviously that includes um, a large portion where there was no effect of vaccination on hospitalization rates. Um, and so I think that at least for hospitalizations, I think it would be hard to read too much into the effect of vaccination um, because the rate ratios display here are cumulative for the entire pandemic. Okay, thanks. Can, um, if I can follow up on that, that's very helpful, Dr. Taylor, just because that helps me um, in, interpret this. It it feels like, perhaps qualitatively, that some of the disparities in vaccination coverage by race have lessened, but there are disparities by other important characteristics, um, socioeconomic status. We talked about poverty. We talked about living in a rural area, um, healthcare access, not having health insurance. So it, at least to me, it feels like looking at this data that we've made a bit of progress in disparities in coverage by race. And then that helps me interpret this, that this is cumulative, so it also captures time period prior to vaccination being widely available. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. King. Um, just to follow up on uh, uh, Matthew's question, is it possible to have this particular slide just showing what has happened to us in the past year because when this data is accumulative, it doesn't necessarily determine what's the latest trend that is happening based on race, death, and hospitalization, so that we're better able to determine what's happening from a demographic uh, standpoint from racial and ethnic population. Thank you very much. Um, at this point, we do not have the slide um, for the last year, but we'll certainly take that into consideration and, and take that back to the, the various teams that, that do this analysis. Thank you. Thank you. And this, um, uh, Dr. Kane, thank you for joining from the, are you representing the National Medical Association today? I am, thank you so much, yes. Thank you, okay, perfect. Um, I also just wanted to uh, emphasize or ask if it is possible, because, because I think both the cumulative numbers as well as the real-time numbers or more recent numbers are helpful. I mean, the cumulative numbers I, I think are incredibly helpful in one area where um, it would be wonderful to be able to also have access to these data um, is with regard to variants where we can access the real-time data, but it's a little harder um, aside from some of the slides that uh, come to this meeting uh, to capture the cumulative data. Um, and then conversely, I think this cumulative data is incredibly helpful, but in terms of supporting real-time decision-making of where our efforts need to um, uh, really need to be uh, emphasized in terms of more recent vaccination activity, having that real-time data, I think, does help support 
both our clinical and our public health response uh, by increasing the awareness of where the gaps and the opportunities are. So um, thank you. Any additional questions? Okay, I don't see any additional hands raised. So why don't we move on to Dr. Tom Shimabukuro's presentation on updates on vaccine-associated myocarditis. And we'll pull up Dr. Shimabukuro's slides, and uh, when they're available, um, you can please get started. Thanks. Um, good morning. Today, I'm going to give an update on myocarditis following mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Just want to mention that um, this information um, has been previously presented at June ACIP and, and VRPAC meetings, um, so th there's there's really no new new data in here. Um, this is this is just um, uh, um, basically presenting um, uh, data that 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 is current through about the end end of May um, and some information uh, that that has been uh, like I said previously presented at federal advisory committee meetings. Next slide. So today I'll give a background on classic myocarditis and myocarditis associated with mRNA COVID-19 vaccination and give an update on myocarditis following mRNA COVID-19 vaccination with a focus on people ages 18 and older, which will include data from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, or VAERS, and the Vaccine Safety Data Link, VSD. Next slide, please. So classic myocarditis usually has an infectious cause. It's typically viral or presumed to be viral although infection with the pathogen is frequently not identified. It can be due to direct microbial infection of myocard myocardial cells and or ongoing inflammatory response with or without clearance of the pathogen. Rare causes include autoimmune hypersensitivity and giant cell myocarditis. The incidence in, in males is greater than females starting after age five years. And as I mentioned, it is common not to identify a pathogen or possible infectious etiology for myocarditis. Based on case series where autopsy tissues were examined and tissue-based infectious disease testing was performed, a specific infectious cause was only identified in 13 to 36% of cases across age groups. And for a case series where endomyocardial biopsy tissues were tested, Viral nucleic acids were detected in heart tissues in approximately 38%, and that includes adults and children combined. Next slide. So this is a, a, a couple figures that have been previously presented um, showing the epidemiology of myocarditis in children and adults, children on the left-hand side, adults on the right-hand side. If you focus on the left-hand, left-sided uh, left graph in children, You'll see that um, after early childhood where uh, genetic or congenital conditions are, are suspected to contribute to myocarditis, um, incidence is low and then begins to increase starting in adolescence. As we shift over to the right-hand uh, right side graph, um, you'll see that incidence peaks in adolescence and then gradually decreases with age. There's a, a striking male to female um, predominance. Um, but that attenuates around middle age. Next slide. So this is a table um, showing the characteristics, showing and comparing characteristics of myocarditis associated with mRNA COVID-19 vaccination and viral myocarditis. So for vaccine-associated myocarditis, the inciting exposure is mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Um, incidence is greater. Um, for uh, following dose two compared to dose one. For viral myocarditis, it's viral illness, and 30 to 60% may have asympto an asymptomatic viral course. Um, mo for vaccine-associated myocarditis, most cases are in adolescents and, and young adults with more cases in males compared to females. For viral myocarditis, um, incidence is higher in males compared to females. Male incidence peaks in adolescence and then gradually declines with age. Uh, for vaccine-associated myocarditis, symptom onset clusters within a few days after vaccination, and I'll show you some data to support that um, for VAERS and VSD. Um, most of these 
vaccine associated cases appear to occur with, within the week of vaccination. For viral myocarditis, onset is typically one to four weeks after viral illness. The next set of characteristics get at clinical severity of cases. Um, in general, myocarditis associated with mRNA COVID-19 vaccination has been relatively clinically mild compared to viral myocarditis. Next slide. And I'll move into findings from the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is the National Spontaneous Reporting or Passive Surveillance System that's co-managed by CDC and FDA. Next slide. Uh, as a passive surveillance system, VAERS accepts reports from anyone, regardless of the plausibility of the vaccine causing the event or the clinical seriousness of the event. The key strengths of VAERS are that it can rapidly detect potential safety problems and can detect rare adverse events. The key limitation is generally we cannot determine cause and effect from VAERS data alone. Next slide. So this is a flow chart. Um, showing U.S. reports to VAERS of myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination among people ages 18 years and older following primary series and first booster doses it's current through the end of May 2022. Um, through the surveillance period, there were 1,836 preliminary reports of myocarditis. 11 remained under review. 504 did not meet case definition. That leaves us with 1,321 reports of myocarditis that were verified to meet case definition. To put that number in perspective, there are approximately 491.9 million primary series and first booster mRNA COVID-19 vaccine doses administered in the United States among people ages 18 and older. Next slide. This is a figure showing time to onset. Um, for these, for the case reports of myocarditis to VAERS among people ages 18 and older. And you'll see here that, that these cases, reported cases, tend to cluster within a few days of vaccination and the overwhelming majority occurring within one week of vaccination. Next slide. So among these 1,321 reports of verified myocarditis, according to the CDC case definition, among people 18 and older. Um, the median age um, where, where age was, uh, was available was 28 years. Median time to symptom onset where that information was available was three days. Um, a minority, 19% of reports had symptom onset seven days after vaccination. Um, most of these uh, reports occurred after dose two, and most of these reports occurred in males. Next slide. This is a table showing VAERS reporting rates of myocarditis for 1 million doses administered after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination in the days 0 to 7 and 8 to 21 days post-vaccination. Um, the, the first thing, the first take-home point from this, uh, from this table is that um, you, you'll notice the peach-shaded cells. Um, th that is where the reporting rate to VAERS exceeds the background rate um, of myocarditis, um, and, and we use that as a proxy for risk. And you'll see that the, the risk, both in males and females, um, is concentrated in the days zero to seven after vaccination. We do not see elevated reporting rates with respect to background rates in the eight to 21 days following vaccination. Reporting rates are substantially higher in males compared to females and the highest reporting rates are observed following dose two, um, with, with uh, reporting rates for boosters tending to fall in between uh, the values for dose one and dose two. Um, and in the older age groups um, for males, really after 49 years and, and younger for females, um, we do not see uh, elevated reporting rates with respect to background rates and the, um, the, 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 the differences in sex appear to attenuate. Next slide. So I'm gonna briefly describe CDC's enhanced surveillance for myocarditis outcomes following mRNA COVID-19 vaccination in various case reports among people aged 12 to 29 years. The purpose of this project was to assess functional status and clinical outcomes among individuals reported to have developed 
myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. It is a two-component survey conducted at least 90 days after the onset of myocarditis symptoms. It includes a patient survey and a healthcare provider survey. Next slide. So I want to focus on the main findings of the uh, cardiologist or healthcare provider survey, and this is a survey of the healthcare providers providing aftercare for these case patients. And based on cardiologist or healthcare provider assessment, most patients appear to have fully or probably fully recovered from their myocarditis. 81.7% um, of patients um, who received a, a, a follow-up assessment um, by a cardiologist or healthcare provider were judged by that healthcare provider as fully recovered or probably fully recovered. Next slide. So the key findings, first, the patient surveys, at least 90 days after myocarditis diagnosis, most patients who were reached reported no impact on their quality of life, and most did not report missing school or work. As I mentioned, um, most 81.7 healthcare providers who completed surveys indicated the patient was fully recovered or probably fully recovered. Of note, there was substantial heterogeneity in initial follow-up treatment and testing, and there did not appear to be a single test that was indicative of recovery. Um, the next steps are additional follow-up with patients who are not yet recovered at the time of the 90-plus day survey and their healthcare providers to further assess recovery status at 12 months. That activity is ongoing. And also follow-up and evaluation of myocarditis cases in children ages five to 11 years, which is ongoing. Next slide. So now I'm gonna move on to findings from our vaccine safety data link, which is uh, CDC's EHR-based system that's used for surveillance and research and is a collaborative project between CDC and nine integrated healthcare organizations that you see here on the map. Next slide. VSD conducts rapid cycle analysis the aims are to monitor the safety of COVID-19 vaccines weekly using pre-specified outcomes and to describe the uptake of COVID-19 vaccines over time among eligible VSD members. Next slide. These are the VSD COVID-19 vaccine rapid cycle analysis pre-specified surveillance outcomes and the settings in which they are monitored. Next slide. So uh, the, the primary VSD RC analytic strategy is a vaccinated concurrent comparator analysis. Um, we look at the number of outcomes observed in the risk interval after COVID-19 vaccination compared to the number expected. The expected was derived from vaccinated concurrent comparators who were in a comparison interval after COVID-19 vaccination. Um, that's simply looking at rates <clears throat> in a risk interval in vaccinated individuals compared to rates in a comparison interval in vaccinated individuals. And for the pre-specified outcome of myocarditis and pericarditis, cases were verified using the CDC case definition. Next slide. These, this is a, a series, a couple figures showing mRNA COVID-19 vaccine doses administered in VSD in people ages 18 to 39 years by week. You have the primary series on the top and the booster um, doses administered on the bottom. Next slide. So this figure shows day of onset of verified myocarditis and pericarditis among people ages 18 to 39 years after either primary series dose of mRNA COVID-19 vaccine. Um, You'll see there is statistically significant clustering in the several days after vaccination um, with, the, with the overwhelming majority of these occurring within a week of vaccination. And this is consistent with the data um, that we observed for VAERS reports. Um, again, this clustering within the first week, cl clustering of onset within the first week after vaccination. Next slide. Um, this is a table looking at verified myocarditis and pericarditis in the zero to seven day risk interval among 18 to 39 year old males by product and dose. The statistic is the adjusted rate ratio. Um, on, the, on the 
the, the top um, major line of this graph, we see the results um, when we, we combine, this is for combined uh, either vaccine, either mRNA vaccine, and you see um, statistically significantly elevated rate ratios, which are bolded um, after dose two and after booster dose. Um, when we look at product specific um, findings for Pfizer, BioNTech, we see uh, elevated adjusted rate ratios um, after dose two and after booster dose, and then for Moderna after dose two. And on the far right-hand column, you'll see how uh, these uh, elevated um, risks are translated into excess cases in the risk period per million doses or excess risk there on the right-hand side. Next slide. So this is a similar table um, for females. Um, one thing to note is that the, the events um, uh, are, are sub the, the, the event counts are substantially lower um, than for males, and um, the, the number of statistically significantly elevated adjusted rate, rate ratios are also less. Um, but for females, um, for, for, for either mRNA COVID-19 vaccine, we have an elevated, statistically significantly elevated adjusted rate ratio after dose two. And then for Pfizer, uh, after, after dose two as well. Um, if you could just, and then you see the excess cases in the risk period on the right-hand column there. So if you could just focus on those adjusted rate ratios um, and then look at the excess cases, I would like you to flip back to the previous slide for males. If you could. You could reverse it one slide. You'll see that um, the, the, the adjusted rate ratios for males and females um, were statistically significant, are, are comparable, but the excess cases in the risk period are substantially greater for males, and that's because the, the condition is, is much more common in males than in females. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, these are the straight incidence rates in VSD of verified myocarditis and pericarditis zero to seven days following mRNA COVID-19 vaccination. Um, the, 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 the general findings here are that the incidence rates are, are, are substantially greater um, in males compared to females. And in general, uh, the incidence rates are highest after dose two. Um, there, there are some exceptions to that, but, um, we're, 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 but, but where you see those exceptions, those are fairly small numbers, and those uh, point estimates may be unstable. Next slide. Uh, this is, this, uh, this uh, table shows the level of care and status of the cases observed in VSD. Um, this is for primary series um, of note. Most of these cases are hospitalized. They have short lengths of stays. The median for either product is one day, and all of these um, case patients were discharged home. Next slide. This is the same table, um, but showing cases after the booster dose, um, very similar to primary series. Most are admitted to the hospital. Um, length of stays are short. Median uh, stay is one day. And again, all cases, case patients discharged home. Next slide. So in summary, the current evidence supports a causal association between mRNA COVID-19 vaccination and myocarditis and pericarditis. Myocarditis is a rare event following vaccination. CDC verified 1,321 cases in people 18 and older after 491.9 million doses uh, administered in this age group in the United States. Cases tend to cluster within the first week of vaccination. The risk is greatest in adolescents and young adults, higher after dose two compared to dose one of the primary series, and higher in males compared to females. Some risk estimates for females in VSD are comparable to males, but case counts are small, and excess risk in females is substantially lower than for males. The risk appears to decrease with age, and the male-to-female predominance of cases attenuates with age. Reporting rates in VARES are highest following dose two, Reporting rates following dose one and first booster dose tend to be lower. Incidence rates in VSD of verified myocarditis and pericarditis zero to seven days following vaccination 
are generally highest following dose two. And the available information suggests that most persons with myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination um, recover from myocarditis by three to eight months after diagnosis. Next slide. I'd like to acknowledge the following groups for their contributions to this presentation. Next slide. Next slide. Thanks, and that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Dr. Shmubakoro, and this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Kane, is your hand still up, or is that from before? No, it's, it's a pie from National Medical Association. So it's interesting that you have a much higher rate a risk for myocarditis from your males compared to females. And we know that if, for example, if you have an acute viral syndrome, that you can increase your risk for developing myocarditis. Did you look at the physical activities related to the males versus the females after their vaccinations? You know, a lot of our males are athletes at that age. And so if they had some prolonged, vigorous exercise that occurred after their vaccination, could it have triggered this myocarditis for males as compared to females? Since we have greater male athletes than, than, um, than um, our females. And, and I say this because should we have a recommendation that after you're vaccinated as a young teenager or young adult, that you should not undergo uh, any strenuous or physical activity for maybe one week after you've received your booster vaccinations. So we don't have that level of detail um, from our surveillance um, regarding uh, association with, with physical activity. Um, if, if Dr. Matt Oster is on the line, he, I think he may want to talk about um, sex as a risk factor and maybe um, uh, what what type of, of physical limitations are recommended. I would say after um, after diagnosis, um, not to be confused with any pro, you know preventive uh, recommendations. Yeah, Tom. Um, so no, we haven't systematically collected that, that information, but I can say anecdotally having you know, reviewed most of these charts and taken care of some of these patients, that the classic story is actually not chest pain happening you know, with vigorous exercise or activity. The, the kind of classic presentation is chest pain that just appears out of nowhere, um, often at rest, you know, whether that be while asleep, watching TV, in church, in school, uh, what have you. Um, you know, certainly there are some that are worth activity, but the vast majority, it's actually the onset is at rest. Um, now, in terms of further physical activity, right, once you have the diagnosis and once you have evidence of cardiac inflammation, um, you know, current guidelines from the professional associations is to, you know, restrain from competitive sports, right, as the way it's phrased, for about three months. Um, you know, although, you know, in this cohort, in these, these, you know, young adults, uh, and adolescents, you know, as Tom showed, are you know, tend to be recovering sooner than kind of the classic myocarditis. Yet that that recommendation is what continues for now. Um, I don't think that any sort of recommendation to avoid physical activity would necessarily change the outcome and change kind of what's going on on a you know uh, molecular basis or, or what have you. Um, we do know historically that men are, are or males are more likely to get myocarditis than females. Um, there's lots of different theories as to exactly why that could be. Um, one of the most common, I guess, predominant theories is just testosterone levels, are certainly higher in males, and that can affect the receptors uh, on the cardiac uh, tissue uh, that are at play here. Um, so, yeah, I think hopefully that answers your question, uh, but I don't think we have any data to suggest that any sort of recommendation for pivoting or limiting activity after vaccination would be appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Long. Yes, thank you, Dr. Shimabakor. Uh, would you go back to the slide that shows males 18 to 39 myocarditis in the zero to seven days post, so we could look again at the 
adjusted risk ratios and excess cases because what you concluded um, was a little different. And I wonder if it's because of lack of tight enough confidence intervals or low number of cases or what is it? I think that's so slide 21. See that slide. So it looked like, um, right, if we look just at Pfizer, you know, that's almost identical um, adjusted rate ratios, those two in booster. But if we look at Moderna, it's 23 and 4.5. And um, so I, but tell me why I don't see how these confidence intervals are so overlapping. But is that the problem? Why didn't you not conclude that uh, the uh, overall incidence is, yes, lower after booster dose, but it's entirely because it's less common with the booster dose of Moderna? Why did you not conclude that? Can, can you repeat? So these aren't in, these aren't incidence rates on here. These are these these are basically looking at looking at rates in a risk interval compared to rates in a comparison interval and doing doing a rate ratio. Um, I mean, if we if we want to look at straight incidence rates, we'd have to go to slide twenty three. Okay. So. Where oh, uh, 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 these okay, so it's eighty one and forty seven. So these are and just to just to clarify, these are straight incidence rates observed in VSD in the zero to seven day post vaccination period. So uh -huh. um, you know these include c cases for cases um, w with any etiology, but I think. Um, we suspect that there's a there's a decent chance that these are vaccine associated cases, given what uh -huh. we know about the epidemiology. Okay, so you would not conclude that there is a difference in the number of excess cases or the likelihood that one would get myocarditis uh, with the booster of Moderna versus um, Pfizer. That would not be a correct conclusion. Well, could you could you go back to slide twenty one again? So, if, if if you look just if you look at these these adjusted rate ratios, um, right. you know when you when you combine both doses or you're looking at product specific, um, you see elevated adjusted rate ratios um, really across the board and um, the, the highest. Rate ratios, um, dose two and booster dose, tends to be higher than than than, than dose one. Um, I mean, not all of these are statistically significant. Keep in mind that these are these in, in some of these analyses, um, some of these strata, these counts are, are are pretty low. But I think the the general trend here is that we're seeing elevated uh, rate ratios uh, uh, across the board. Um, uh, and all of these analysis, um, you know, some of which um, reach statistical significance. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Sanchez. Thank you, and thanks, Tom. Um, it's I along the same lines <laughs> as Dr. Long, and can we? Then say that um, that the that the myocarditis has is um, seen more with the Moderna than with the Pfizer. I mean, you haven't even heard an explicit statement. And the other thing is, do you have the timing of when that booster was given? Um, or and I think that previously you had said that we've pretty much adhered to the you know, three to four week schedule between dose one and two. Um, and I was wondering if you have or will have some of that data in terms of the timing of the booster 
and um, occurrence of myocarditis. So, so I, I think we have, to answer you the first part of your question, we have good information that in, in, in the United States during the period of this analysis, adherence to the primary series schedule was, was quite good. Actually, could you go back to that slide, please? Possible. Um, uh, I, I don't, I don't um, know off the top of my head uh, what, what the variability around the timing of the booster dose is. So I think that's something we would, we would need to, to, to look, at, look at further. Um, to answer your first question, um, we have done uh, a direct head-to-head -head comparison um, between the two products, Pfizer and Moderna, um, and there have been other, uh, other groups um, that have also um, done uh, comparisons as, as well. Um, the findings from a, a recent VSD analysis, which was published, which has been published in Vaccine, um, show that there is some evidence uh, of, of, a, of an increased risk of myocarditis um, for Moderna compared to Pfizer, um, which did reach statistical significance in, in one of the sub-analysis we did. Um, FDA did a similar uh, analysis in BEST and, and uh, did, did not detect an increased risk. There's also data from um, other countries that have looked at this. And I think the, the, um, the general trend is that there has been observed uh, that the, the, that there has been observed a a uh, a, a modest increased risk um, uh, for Moderna compared to Pfizer, but it has not been consistent across all systems and analyses. Thank you. I think that um, you know, I think that's important because um, as we make recommendations for selected individuals, I think that that also enters in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Palin. All right, thank you, Dr. Shimabukura, for a very wonderful um, presentation and very clear. Um, uh, I was thinking along uh, similar lines as Dr. Sanchez, um, and when I looked at your um, rate uh, or the timing of vaccination, it looks like most people stuck to the, uh, the primary series for at least the um, adults. And so that there's not really an opportunity to look at spreading the dose, but I'm hopeful that that looks um, uh, that um, for children will be able to look and see if spreading um, the primary series eight weeks apart will be feasible. My question for you is um, about booster dose. Is this any booster dose or is this first booster dose? And is there plans to look about second booster dose? Thank you. My understanding is that this analysis um, is limited to the, the the first what we think believe is the first booster dose. Um, uh, uh, looking at other booster doses would be a, an additional analysis. I see Dr. Klein has raised her hand. Hi, thank you. I just wanted just to comment on the earlier um, discussion about the the booster dose timing and these it's not on the slide which we apologize as an oversight but these analyses are adjusted for time since the primary series and the booster doses thank you uh, dr lair yes thank you for this wonderful presentation a small reminder that even though it's very clear that there's a causal related association, there's also an association between getting the COVID disease and getting myocarditis and pericarditis. I know that's coming up later in a further presentation, but I think it's appropriate to bring that up now to remind people that the risk is actually higher if you are getting the disease for getting myocarditis and pericarditis versus getting it from the vaccine. Thank you. Could, could I have Dr. Oster, um, like further elaborate on the risk of adverse cardiac outcomes um, with disease um, compared to vaccination, because I think he has a unique perspective on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can add, you know, we, we presented some of that data before when I was published in NWR. I mean, just overall, um, even in the, the highest risk group, so across all groups, you know, the risk of you know, cardiac manifestations of myocarditis or pericarditis or 
MISD with cardiac involvement um, is certainly higher after you know, getting SARS-CoV-2 versus um, having vaccine. Um, and even in the highest risk group, which would be your adolescent and young adult male, uh, that, that being the highest risk group for having, you know, heart involvement after vaccine, uh, it was still two to six times greater to have significant heart involvement after getting COVID than after getting vaccine. Um, so, uh, so yes, I mean, I think the point is well made that you know, COVID is a serious disease and it does have you know, significant cardiac manifestations. Uh, you know, in those who, you know, in a, in a small subset that can contract it, it's still a higher subset than after that scene. Thank you. And we'll um, move to Dr. Daly for the last question. Yeah, thanks so much. I mean, I, I mean, I think while we'd all argue it's very important for us to understand what's going on here, I, I guess I was in the context of today's discussion thinking about what does this help us think about in terms of anticipation of anything um, myocarditis related with a new vaccine that's focused on spike protein, but uses a different technology. So, um, Tom, I wonder, Dr. Schmerbocker, I wonder if you could just remind us what the surveillance, assuming that there's a positive vote for this vaccine later today, can you remind us what the planned surveillance would look like? And then a second question is if you, um, or second comment is if you, um, you know, learn of additional study of the underlying sort of pathophysiology of vaccine-associated myocarditis, if you could bring that back to the group too, if you kind of learn more about planned studies there, uh, over. I'd be, be happy to come back um, and describe any um, work uh, I'm going to look at, at, at the mechanism or, um, or pull in folks who are, who are actually doing the work to inform the, the committee. Um, as far as surveillance, um, myocarditis and pericarditis, uh, it's an adverse event of special interest for VAERS. Um, so we will be specifically um, looking for reports suspicious of myocarditis and pericarditis and reviewing uh, every one of those reports, following up on those reports to get medical records or to contact healthcare providers <coughs> to get sufficient information to apply the CDC case definition so we can verify these reports. And we'll be um, doing uh, enhanced surveillance for myocarditis and pericarditis after Novavax, similar to what we've done for um, the mRNA vaccines. Um, we, will, we will also be in, incorporating uh, surveillance for, for Novavax uh, in, into VSD rapid cycle analysis. Um, how we do the RCA um, may depend on uh, what, what, how much uptake there is and how much, um, how much meaningful data um, we get in VSD, but we plan to, to do monitoring um, for, uh, for, for myocarditis and pericarditis and other pre-specified outcomes um, for, for Novavax in VSD as well. And uh, we also have our clinical immunization safety assessment project, which is available um, as a consult service for U.S. healthcare providers um, to, uh, to, 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 to receive a, a consultation on, on patients with complex adverse events um, after Novavax or, or any other um, vaccines for that matter. Right. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Shima Bukoro, and to all of our presenters for this morning's session. We are now going to move to a break. We're going to take nine minutes and reconvene at 30 minutes after the hour uh, for the next presentation.